going through challenges that are traumatic and being able to move forward. And Rabbi Sachs begins with what exactly happened in Abraham's life. So if we want to not look at the papers, but let's just think ourselves, what so far, what, what has Avraham gone through so far in his life? Any trauma that you can think of? Unknown. Would anyone like to share any thoughts? What type of trauma Avraham has gone through in his life? Um... Anna. Um, I would assume that the first one is not to have children for so long. Okay. Um, that's definitely a very difficult situation. Um, the second one, he was, he, he, when, when he had both sons, Isaac and Ishmael, he probably saw the different qualities of his second son that he was not probably very happy, happy with, in my opinion. Definitely the death of his wife. Um, definitely many troubles that he saw that are going on with people who are not believers. And he really needed to promote his, uh, you know, his faith in one God, which was probably very difficult among so many of his, even, even family members and neighbors and friends who were uh, wor worshiping and idols. Um, and in general, it was the life at that time was pretty difficult when he started to uh, bring strangers to his um, whatever tent where he would, you know, really try to promote his his belief. That was pretty difficult too, in my opinion. Was I think that his his whole life was dedicated to one mission uh, to prove that his belief, that his faith, is not only the most valid for him, but to convince other people that that's something that they should join him in, in their belief. So I don't know if I would call that trauma, that specific thing of, of being on a mission to teach people. I would just say definitely it's a challenge. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, but the other things you mentioned definitely were more traumatic. You know, the... the, the but uh, but he, he is such a strong believer in it that he was even willing to sacrifice his own son that he was waiting for such a long time it means that probably people who disagreed or somehow uh, denied his his uh, his belief were very difficult for him. I don't. I agree with you that the word trauma is probably something much more drastic. But but it is for someone that there's disagreement. If you you are so hundred percent sure that that's what it is. And people around you are doubting it. It's it's pretty difficult to tolerate. In that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, there's fear of rejection. There's the uh, right. right. There's a, there's definitely some uh, emotional uh, uh, challenging uh, moments uh, when you try right. to when you get to you know when when you telemarket and they slam the phone on you. It's never, <laughs> not a good feeling, you know. Uh, and, uh, yeah. From a yeah, from a you. Front, you really worded out so much better, but I think we both are kind of looking at that as a, the same the same subject. Okay, thank you. So thank you, uh, Anna. That's a good a lot of good points over there. So not having children and seeing everyone else uh, walking around with strollers, you know, that's for sure. Uh, uh, you know, traumatic and uh, going from doctor to doctor probably, and they're giving up hope and telling you it's impossible. And, um, you know, and from uh, which I'm just guessing that he probably had such situations where uh, they probably told him to, it's not, it's not going to happen. And, um, uh, you know, the uh, seeing his, uh, his first son uh, going through uh, his stages of rebelliousness and so on. Yishmael, a pera adam. A, a, the, the English translation of a pera adam is a, a wild ass of a man, which, uh, uh, you know, basically is he, he was a, a ganev, a, a crook, yeah. a murderer, you know, big, uh, yeah. a, a, vilde, a vildechaya. 
<laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, that must have been uh, traumatic dealing with, especially they didn't have, it wasn't popular maybe that people's children, we don't know if, uh, if uh, at least uh, uh, people who are trying to, uh, trying to teach the world and then their children uh, act this way, you know, it like ruins what you try to, you know, whatever you try to do. He goes and has a, try, is almost convincing someone to believe in God. And then his son comes and, and pickpockets the guy. And, uh, and like, you know, you ruin, it could be he ruined uh, the things that uh, Abraham tried to teach. You know what I mean? When he sees his son acting that way. So you never know what type of mess, you know, how mess, how, how he messed up things for his father. We don't, we don't really know um, too much detail about that. But, um, and then losing his wife. Now, Rabbi Sachs. I don't know if you see the hands, but. Uh, I don't see the hands. So you could feel free to just talk about oh, it. Oh, uh, I've been holding my hand. Oh, okay, Anyhow, Ben, yeah. I wanted to say even his walk, leaving the, the family and country is in and taking such a long walk, it's very traumatic. It's not, it's not, he's not taking a flight. He's walking. <laughs> Where are you talking from? When he left from, from Ukashdim to to Israel, mm -hmm. so a long that's a way. good point. There is no restaurants that you, or McDonald's that you can stop in. So right. you, you know it's difficult. McDavid, McDavid, McDavid. Right in in Jerusalem, there's a McDavid. <laughs> but um, uh, the truth of the matter is, we really need to take step back and look at his life from 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 his youth right so from his youth there definitely were more stories of of uh trauma uh he uh he he had to speak to the king nimrod his father mm -hmm. brought him there after he uh, destroyed the idols his father <laughs> brought him in front of the king imagine being brought and uh they're judging his life in front of the king imagine such a situation, you know, you get into trouble with your parents, you sort of know more, more or less what they're going to do to you. But when you, uh, uh, when you get in trouble and they, they bring you to the king, I mean, this is like, this is serious trauma. He had no idea what was, you know, what was going to happen. In fact, the king threw him into a furnace. Right. So that itself was huge, huge trauma before he got thrown into the furnace and, and, and at the throwing into the furnace. And then his brother died there because his brother was thrown into the furnace and his brother Haran died in the furnace. So this was uh, oh, probably very traumatic as well. He, he lived miraculously. He walked out without a, without a burn, without a scrape, without a scratch. But his brother, they asked his brother Haran, do you also want to follow Abraham? Now, the problem was Haran was not uh, t totally uh, in line with Avraham and he was sort of expecting a miracle to happen for him and uh, or at least hoping and he chose to to, to, to follow in Avraham's uh, opinion and they were gonna and then they threw him into the furnace and he uh, it didn't it, it didn't uh, go well for him and uh, so that was traumatic. And then Abraham and his father and his relatives, they go to Haran from Orkazdim. They travel to Haran. And at that point, Abraham is, uh, uh, Abraham and his father, uh, well, Abraham leaves his father and uh, travels on to Israel. Israel. Now, with Lot. with Lot and his wife, he goes with his wife and Lot, and he, as Hashem tells him to leave his father, and he goes to Israel. Now, Avram at that time when he left was 75. He left Haran at the age of 75. Now, how old was his father? His father was 145 because he was 70 years old when he was born. His father was 70. So if Avram was 75, that means that uh, his father is 145. Now that's also traumatic, leaving his father at that age. That might have been so. He went through. 
So he had the the uh, thrown into the furnace, being in front of him. He, um, let me just mute everyone here one second. Let me see if I can do that. Okay. Okay, just just muted everyone. I didn't hear what you said, Ben. I said we just learned in the morning that your friend shouldn't hear you. <laughs> so um so the uh so so here we have a few traumatic experiences. Now um Avraham leaves his father and he travels to Israel, and in Israel, there's no, there's a famine, so that could be pretty traumatic. Going to sleep two days without food, who knows, you know? And then uh, um, seeing, probably seeing people dead, you know, if there's a famine, must have, you know, who knows what type of trauma was there. Then going to Egypt, and this is a very important point. I'm surprised no one wants to, no one mentioned it here. Anyone? Think of anything else that was traumatic in Avraham's life? He had to hide his wife in a box twice. Oh, I think he froze. And uh, in the end, what happened to her? That that was traumatic for her, maybe, to be in the box. <laughs> but what, what about him? Yeah. What was traumatic for him was probably... That she was taken from him. When she was taken as a captive. You know, that's quite a uh, scary thing. His wife is taken, captured, and he doesn't know what happened to her. No idea what they did. So that's uh, definitely traumatic. And then she was captured. Then there was a second time, a second uh, time she was kidnapped to Avi Melech, the king of Gerar. So that was pretty traumatic. And there's also a little trauma along the way. Uh, it does say that when he traveled back from Egypt, he paid up his debts. What does that sound like? It sounds like he ran out of money on his way to Egypt. And maybe he left them uh, his jacket, you know, because he didn't have money to pay for the hotel. In the olden days, right, if you didn't have money for gas, I think they would uh, take your jacket until you come back or something. And uh, but anyway, so he, it, it seems much. like he must have been he must have ran out of money. So that's also traumatic, especially because he's claiming that God watches over everyone. Now, how does that fit with his with his mission and his pitch that he's trying to convince people to believe in God? And then he doesn't even have money to pay for his hotel. So he's got quite, you know, that's traumatic as well. He's, he's, he's trying to help God out, be what I would call God's salesman. He's, he's really selling God to the people. That's what Abraham is. He's, he's really a salesman for God. Yes, Moshe. So his wife was also his sister, wasn't she? Sarai. I mean, they, I mean, they were, they were not, not only was she his wife, but it was his sister as well. Half a sister. Now, what do you mean, his sister? Did they have the same father or the same mother? I don't know. I this is what our rabbi mentioned uh, that I heard. Uh, I heard it actually a few times. I said, "Say you're my sister." So, so uh, I heard so, she was half a sister. So they, they 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 were both grandchildren of. They were. Well, she was a grandchild of Terach, and he was a son of Terach. Mm -hmm. So uh, some people can call their grandfather their father. So you could call him a sister, call her a sister, but she wasn't. They didn't have the same father or the same, you know, or the so same. So are we saying, I mean, I, I, what I'm asking is, was there incest within this Family structure. I mean, I'm I'm trying to figure this out. So the uh, the thing was, if you if you this is Abraham married his niece. That's not considered incest. A man marrying his aunt would be incest, but a man marrying a niece is not. 
I see. I see. Okay. So, um, so the uh, the trauma there uh, would seemingly be that his wife was being kidnapped, and um, uh, and and then that he ran out of money. You know, it's it's not a good feeling to to not have any money, and uh, it seems like that's what he did because he. When he came out of Egypt, miraculously, he, uh, the king of Egypt gave him some wealth. And with that wealth, he paid up his para hakafaisov, it says. When he left Egypt, he went the same, to stayed in the same hotels uh, on the way back to Israel in order to pay up his debts. So we seem to find a lot of trauma. Then you have the, uh, the story of the Akedah. So finally he's born. They suffered the years of, of childlessness. And then uh, finally, um, you know, Yitzchak is, is born. And uh, this is Av- Avraham's uh, future. This is Avraham's life. This is what it's going to be. This is what the his entire, the, 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 you know, the, the, the entire Jewish people is going to be standing on their shoulders. And so Abraham has a son, Isaac, who's fit to be this leader. And, uh, and then Hashem tells him to slaughter his son. And he goes there and he's about to slaughter his son. He's got the, the, the knife held above Yitzchak's neck. And he's about to slaughter him. And... Uh, and that was quite traumatic. Again, afterwards, the angel tells him not to. But at least at that point, when the, the knife is there, that's probably quite traumatic as well. And then Sarah passes away. So the passing of Sarah, these two things happen right at the same time. Because right when he returned from the uh, desire, to, from the co- commandment to slaughter his son, right when he returned, his wife had died. And there are different opinions as to exactly how she, what caused her to pass away then, the, knowing that her son, for her, knowing that her son was going to be slaughtered, that caused her to die out of like a heart attack, so to speak. At least on a very simple level. That is the uh, that would be the understanding of why she died. So once she heard that he had almost that 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 Avraham was about to slaughter his son, her son, and his son. Uh, once she heard that, she was she 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 died. She, she died in a second. And so uh, at least uh, according to one one understanding, that that's uh, it was very traumatic for her. Imagine for Avraham also it must have been traumatic. And again, Anna had told us that you know th- this is part of his. This was Avram's mission, and this was his, 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 you know, his whole life was, you know, serving Hashem. But at the same time, it would seem that there might have been some, or the, you know, logically, you know, he was still human. And being human, he would have, uh, should have, uh, uh, you know, he, he is, he, you know, there, there's, there's different types of, of servants, you know, and a ser- but a servant that doesn't have any feeling of his own. That's not exactly what God wants from us. In other words, if you are going to love Hashem, part of loving Hashem is to feel that love. If you're such a servant that you don't have any feeling, you won't end up, you, 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 you can't say you love Hashem. If, you know, you need to have some type of a emotional self to, you know, you could be, to, you give over your life to Hashem, but at the same time, you need to have you need to be a you, in order to, in order to, in order to love, and um, and so it would seem that you know it must have been very traumatic, and uh, and then losing his wife. Now, how old was his wife when she passed away? One twenty-seven. One hundred and twenty-seven. Thank you, Ezra. So, how old was Avraham at the time? One thirty-seven. 137, because Avraham, we know, was 10 years older. When Avraham had a child, when he had, when Avraham had Yitzchak, Avraham was 100. 
and when and, and, and Sarah, his wife, was 90, right? Now, Avraham, we know he was married at the age, he was for sure married by the age of 75. And uh, uh, was, we don't know how long he was, at least uh, it's not clear in the Torah how long he was married for, but he was definitely married. Uh, they were married for, uh, you know, for more than uh, 60 years. Because from 75 to 137 is 62 years. Uh, and uh, probably longer. We just don't know how long. Uh, so it must have been very traumatic uh, to uh, have lost, lost his wife. And uh, so now, how old was Isaac? And this is what most people don't know. How old was Isaac when he was going to be slaughtered as a sacrifice on the altar? So just think. I, that's correct. I, I, Isaac was 37 years old because they all happened at the same time. If S Sarah passed away at the age of 127 and Sarah's 90 years older than her son, than Yitzchak, and Avram is 137 and he's 100 years older than Yitzchak, I mean, Yitzchak has to be 37 years old when the mother died and when which means that at the same time, that's when he was being slaughtered. He was going to be slaughtered at the age of 37. So a lot of people think of him as being a child, and that's not true. He was not a child at the time. He was, a, he was an adult. He was, a, he was in a, you know, almost middle age. He was getting there. And uh, he was very well aware of what was happening. Now, uh, so Rabbi Sachs here uh, talks about these two traumatic experiences specifically that both happened at the same time. The uh, trauma of the, uh, uh, the death of Sarah and the trauma of almost slaughtering Yitzchak, which means with that knife in his hand and he's thinking, uh-oh, what, what am I doing? What could God be asking from me? Now, Rabbi Sachs uh, puts in the, the backdrop of this whole thing is the fact that Hashem had made two promises to Avraham. What were the two main promises that God gave Abraham? Ben, ben we can't hear you. You're, you're muted. That his family will inherit the land from him. That's right. So they're going to have the land of Israel. And uh, not only are they going to have the land of Israel, but that he will have children. These were his two main promises. Now think about the trauma that he's going through. He's about to slaughter his son, which means that the promise of having children with Sarah is about to end because Isaac is not married. They don't have, there's no wife that uh, might be pregnant. There's no grandchildren. So that promise is about to end. Rabbi? And, just one second. and Isaac, so uh, Isaac doesn't have children, so there's no future there. And what does Abraham need that his wife passed away? He needs a grave. And they're in Israel. And guess what? God promised him the land of Israel. He doesn't have one inch of it. He's got to try to beg someone for a, to buy a piece of land. So he doesn't have the, the what God's promise for the land is not coming. Doesn't seem to happen yet. And God's promise for children seems to become nullified. So these are uh, that he's going through and, and living through is uh, quite severe. Yes, Moshe. I, I just wanted to point out something that's was a juxtaposition here in some ways i think that's the terminology that they use is that you know there was a sacrifice that was made on behalf of avraham avino it was his wife she's the one that died in this process not yitzhak she was sacrificed if by what you're saying is true just that that triggered off a heart attack the death 
the, the death of, of, of her son, she was the sacrifice, not Yitzhak. And the, and the lamb, I mean, it, it should be called Chaya's, I, 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 I'm, I'm Sarah's, uh, Chaya, instead of Chaya's Sarah, well, I, I shouldn't say that, but I, I, it seems to me that that's, that, that Sarah was the sacrifice. So uh, what you're saying is a, a cute line that, you know, that she ended up being the sacrifice. It's, you know, it's, it's different. It's, it's different than one would have uh, 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 simply uh, understood it. But um, the thing is that uh, uh, we understand that this was her, her life was meant to be, to end at the age at that age. But what you said just uh, shortly that this could have triggered off a heart attack when she found out that she died almost immediately when she found out when she thought that Yitzhak was, was, was slaughtered. Right. So that, so that is one that, way of understanding it. Uh, I'm not saying it's the only interpretation, but that is one of the ways of uh, understanding it. And, um, and all that means is that God has different ways of ending someone's life not that they weren't meant, it's not that it wasn't meant to be ended at that time. You know what I mean? In other words, that was her time. And the physical the slaughter, God, a physical slaughter and a, and a spiritual slaughter. And that could have been like a spiritual slaughter for her because when she that pierced right through her, you know, well, almost when like someone a light dies, point. yeah, when someone dies, would you call that a spiritual slaughter? You could, I guess, because it's the, it's not done, you know, there's not a physical. You don't actually so knife the, goes wounds, through like, the person who's losing that other person. Right. And it, it's, it's like a knife going through the person who lost the one that they care about. And it's also, uh, it's also for the one who's di- who dies also. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, you could call it that if you'd like, you could so, call it that. So fine. That that's okay. If you want to uh, use that term. So in any event, uh, the bottom line is that, what what Rabbi Sachs wants to gain from this uh, essay is so how does one well, overcome these traumas? So now that we've proven that they they are, let me just mute everyone again here. Somehow, now that we've proven that these are uh, traumatic, um, uh, you know that that the, the, these experience were quite traumatic and uh, I've taken it much uh, further than uh, Rabbi Sachs because uh, Rabbi Sachs just mentions these two and I, I sort of see a lot of his life uh, ha- you know he did go through much trauma um, and uh, what Rabbi Sachs wants to say is let's try to learn from from Avraham what should one do if they want to learn how to be resilient and how to, you know, be able to handle it. So of course, everyone has the option to go to nowadays, we just go to, you know, take some medicine and uh, get drunk or medicine or uh, uh, therapy and so on. But what was Avraham's way and what, what does the Torah tell us? So, uh, Rabbi Sachs mentions that he, he mentions that in one of the most extraordinary sequences of the words in the Torah, Avraham's grief is described in a mere five Hebrew words. In English, it would be Avraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And then immediately we read, and Avraham rose from his grief. Now that is truly a a, um, miraculous way of of being able to, you know, just one verse later, he already arose from his grief. Like how, 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 how was he able to do that? And from then on, he, engaged in a flurry of activity with two aims in mind, which was first to buy a plot of land, which to bury Sarah, and second to find a wife for his son. So, and these are, you know, these correspond to the two main promises that Abraham was given. Number one, the promise of the land, 
And number two, the promise of children. Now, Rabbi Sachs sees the fact that Abraham goes and buys a piece of land, even though God promised him the land of Israel. Rabbi Sachs says, you see from here this concept that God helps those that help themselves. God wants us to sort of like uh, uh, do the initial, uh, try to make the initial step. And he wanted Abraham to actually buy a piece of land. And uh, ultimately, you know, God will give us the land of Israel, but uh, you, you should start. You got to do your, your step, take your step. And, uh, and that would be uh, buying a piece of land. And uh, with that, God's blessing will, will take place. And that's a very interesting uh, side point that Rabbi Sachs brings over here about, you know, making that, taking that step uh, first. And ultimately, uh, God will uh, shower his blessings with it. In other words, you can't just sit back and expect God's problem. God, God supports every, every person. So maybe I'm not even going to go to work. Let me just sit back and do nothing. God, God loves everyone, right? So, of course, he's going to uh, provide. He provides, doesn't he? He provides for everyone. So why should I even try to go to work, get a job? No, nah, I'll sit back. And, and, and that idea is obvious that, you know, God helps those that, that help themselves, uh, you know, and that God wants us to, uh, to do our part. And Rabbi Sachs sees this being one of the examples. And that, that's what's interesting. The idea is not so surprising, but what's to, to, to use this as Avraham buying a piece of land as sort of like a means to stimulate the blessing of God, to get that blessing of God to, to, uh, to happen. Uh, sort of needed Avraham to buy a piece of land to bury his wife, Sarah, which would ultimately allow him, it would give him the, 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 the beginning uh, introduction of, of, the, of that blessing to, uh, to start taking place. So uh, that's, a, that's a nice uh, insight. Then Rabbi Sachs mentions that uh, how do you, who, do, who would he like to learn moral courage from and he says his mentors in moral courage were holocaust survivors and he said how could it be how did they how were they able to to move forward and build up to build their life uh, he said even the soldiers the american soldiers that came to um, liberate the camps. They were so traumatized that it was a. It was it, what they saw in the in the uh, concentration camp stayed in their mind for their entire life. He said, "How about the people that lived that day in and day out? How did they handle the? How how did, how were they able to get over that trauma?" He mentions about someone entered the camp as an American soldier and the sight his eyes saw transformed his life. Uh, and he says, if that was true about those who just saw Bergen Belsen in the other camps, how, how, how almost infinitely more so those who lived there and saw many people die there. And yet the survivors I knew had the most tenacious hold on life I wanted to understand how they kept going. So that's the, the question. Abraham, we see, seems to have been able to move forward. And uh, the Holocaust survivors, after their trauma, which was uh, unimaginable to anyone who didn't see it and live it, uh, how were they able to uh, keep going and um, build, build their life? Eventually, I discovered, Rabbi Sachs says, most of them did not talk about the past, even to their marriage partners, even to their children. They set about creating a new life in a new land. They learned the language, the customs. They built careers, married, had children. 
And they became like an extended family to one another. The Holocaust survivors had something in common with each other. So they looked forward. They did not look back. They had, they had yes. meetings for, like groups from each city would have a club. And then they would write a book about the their place they came from and the people that were there and all that. So they had pictures. So that was, that was really their pastime, you know, in those clubs. So I, I guess what he means is they would not look back at the Holocaust years. Right, no. Maybe they, they looked back before that. They, look, they looked for the future. The future. But the, but the club was, was for them to get together with the people they knew. Uh, we're talking about a Landsmannschaft. Yeah. I have t two of those memorial books here, uh, Yiddish and English from two different towns. And yes, it was a catharsis for people to give over their memories and their pictures. Right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. my, my father helped for their club to, to print their book. So they all did it. Uh-huh, interesting, interesting. So what, what, when you say the pictures, you mean the pictures of before the Holocaust? Yes, yes. Like, like most of them, the younger people would be in, in uh, conditioning uh, classes, conditioning for Israel. Uh -huh. Even before the Holocaust, they were getting ready to go to Israel. Mm. They called it Achshara. Uh -huh. Then there was a Shomer Atzair. So I know my mother, my father, they all were, were in those groups and getting ready. Interesting, interesting. So, uh -huh. uh, so Rabbi Sachs says that the uh, what he found in the in the Holocaust survivors was their um, uh, their their style of uh, their their way of uh, living was not to talk about the past, not even to their spouses, not to their children, and uh, they, they 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 set about on creating an entirely new life and a new place, new life, you know, and. Uh, and but once they, once they got once they got their life together, you know, and, and got a place and, and a job or whatever it was, that's when they started going to the clubs, you know. Uh-huh. Getting together. Well, I, I think well Rabbi Sachs mentions that after about 40 or 50 years later, only then did they speak about their past. And I think what yes. he means is did they speak about their life in the concentration camps? Yes. I think that's what he's referring to. Like, they didn't want to talk about their life in the concentration camps until 40 or 50 years later. Right. Those that were in the concentration camps. Yeah. So that was when they told their story first to their families and to the world. And what the message that Rabbi Sachs sees from the Holocaust survivors was build the future and only then can you mourn the past? Right. It's, it's all about building and just thinking, focusing on the future. Because, you know, one of the uh, problems people have in life is they're so uh, involved with dealing with their past situations. This one insulted me and that one, I won't step foot in that store because <laughs> they didn't let me return something. I tried, I, they, I, I didn't have the receipt and they, they don't want to give me credit, and this one doesn't, this one, this place doesn't want to do that. And that synagogue, oh boy, that guy who was emba embarrassed me over there, and this one. And, and we live with these feelings of, you know, we're, uh, we, we, we let the, these feelings grow inside us. And it, it really, uh, it, it, it stops us. It's an obstacle for our ability to move forward and, 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 and live our life. We're so... Well, uh, burdened with these with these past feelings and and uh, you know there's a righteous there's a righteous way to do that too. My father tells me that a ship showed up outside Lezhensk or whatever from I don't know one of the 
Israeli organizations. And my grandfather with his talus and tefillin walked up the ramp with whatever the family and one kid who was working on the lanyards there said, oh, Zaidi, don't worry about it. You don't need that anymore. He goes, what? He goes, my talus and tefillin, I won't need this anymore? He goes, no, 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 you don't need this anymore. We're building a new country. And my Zaidi turned around and went down the ramp with everybody <laughs> back to Lezhensk. So there's nothing, you can go very off looking for your new life also. But, yeah. Interesting. That's an interesting point, Isaac. Very one interesting. Thing, one thing, it wasn't easy. Yeah, right. Build a country. Right. Well, uh, that's that is an interesting point. What does it mean to build a future? Uh, building a future without losing your morals and ethics of the past, you know, without losing your your mission and your 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 what your life is all of what. what or you're so determined to, to clean up and not make the same mistake and. Whatever, it can be very treacherous. Uh huh. Uh huh. So, um, Rabbi Sachs wants to connect this with Avraham. That what do we find with Avraham? And it is interesting that the verse he brings, he says, Avraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And right afterwards, and Avraham rose from his grief. And he's getting involved with uh, buying a plot of land. And uh, getting a wife for Sarah, for, yeah, for Isaac. And, yes, Moshe. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. But if, you know, what, what concerns me is that if Hashem, Hashem wanted Abraham to buy a, a plot of land for, uh, to buy a plot of land. But, and that's supposed to represent for all of us that we should be buried in Eretz Yisrael, you know, based on, on, on that, because that's supposed <laughs> to set an example for all of us to be buried in, in the land of Israel and Eretz Yisrael. So why is it so that there's two people pay two hundred thousand dollars to be sent to Israel to be buried? I mean, if it's that it's, it doesn't seem that you know Hashem wants everybody to be buried, all Jews to be buried in Israel. You know, I mean, um, I don't know if your statement is true. Uh, just because you know, if if Abraham was living in Egypt and uh, he decided to bring Sarah to Israel to get buried, you know, fine. If Avram was living in Australia and he decided to bring uh, Sarah to Israel to get buried, then definitely there's a message there, you know. But if Avram was living in Israel and he's buying a piece of land there, uh, you know, that doesn't really sound like a proof that you're supposed to be buried in Israel. It's not clear uh, that there is a mitzvah to be buried in Israel. There is a benefit to be buried in Israel. And the benefit is that with the time when the Trias HaMesim comes, well, there's a few benefits. One is that it says that the earth of Israel is an atonement to, to some extent, whatever that means, um, that the land of Israel is an atonement. In fact, even nowadays, all the funeral homes, the Jewish funeral homes, they give you a little bag of earth that's from Israel because it's supposed to be a, some type of atonement by being buried with the earth of Israel. But especially if a person's buried in Israel, there's some level, there's some type of atonement uh, that the land, there is a verse that says that the, the, the land will, will atone for its people. So there is a concept that there's atonement, but there's also a concept that the time when the resurrection of the dead takes place. So uh, we're all going to travel. Anyone who passed away is going to travel underground through different tunnels to um till to, to get to israel uh and uh, the people that are in israel already they won't have to go through the uh that pain so there is a, a it could be that the trias mason will take place first in israel so there might be some there are some benefits in israel um but there is a lot of discussion about this among uh you know in the in the, in the later uh, codifiers i know rabbi moshe feinstein has a has an essay, has an article about this in his uh, Igris Maisha about being buried in Israel and uh, what type of, uh, you know, this would be something to discuss when you talk about, you know, Jacob telling, uh, telling uh, Joseph 
that he wants him to bury him in Israel. That would be really yeah. where to bring up this idea, uh, Moshe. Here, we don't really, it's not really so applicable. Here, you know, she passed away in Israel and he's burying her there. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not really much of a, of a proof to this idea. This, if you want to ask such a question, it, it, you, would, you, would want to, you, would, you would ask it really where in that story of, of uh, where uh, uh, Jacob gets his, his son, Joseph, Yaakov asked Yosef to promise him that he's not going to be buried in Egypt. And over there, Rashi gives a, a few uh, answers, explanations of why. So <clears throat> by their logic, though, Aliyah would also have the same implication as, uh, as a, being a, a benefit instead of uh, being the other. I mean, in other words, it, 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 Aliyah is, does not, doesn't seem that it's not as necessary to go on Aliyah to Israel. As a, you know, if that's the case, as it is with the with a burial, by what you're saying. So you want to know if there's a mitzvah to live in Israel? If, if living there and being buried there are they? They're not mutually exclusive of each other. If, if because you're, if you, if there's going to be a resurrection, that's the same as an aliyah, but in the future, you know, it's a it's an investment in the future. Right, for, but you don't have to go through the tunnels if uh, when Mashiach comes. Uh, Possibly, you know, possibly we're, we're going to go in Manane Shmaya. Hopefully, we'll merit to fly above on, on the uh, on the clouds. But the uh, the idea, the point is that they are mutually exclusive. They're not really necessarily connected. Uh, the uh, living in Israel, and even that itself is not so uh, simple. To what extent is the obligation and the mitzvah to live in Israel? Uh, according to some, it's only a mitzvah that's not an obligation there are some mitzvahs that aren't really obligations they're like extra credit a lot of people think when you say mitzvah it means oh you get a good deed like you don't have to do it but you'll get like a an extra an extra bonus you know you'll get some extra extra points extra credit uh, in, in that's Israel, not true most just one second in, most mitzvahs just one second most mitzvahs are obligations the word mitzvah really comes from the word command but there are certain individual mitzvahs that that sort of like fall out of that category and they are called mitzvah kiyumis. It's like an, it's a mitzvah you could fulfill, but you don't have to fulfill. And there are a few of them. It's not there aren't so many. Some people say like eating matzah throughout Pesach. The first night of Pesach is an obligation to eat matzah. What about eating matzah d- during the rest of the days of Pesach? Of course, you can't eat bread or uh, cereal or, 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 you know, anything that's hummus, leaven. But are you obligated to eat matzah uh, in the middle of, of Pesach? Is there a mitzvah when you eat matzah? Am I doing an extra mitzvah of eating matzah? And the, the answer is, according to some, that yes, there is actually a mitzvah. It's just not an obligation. You could. Uh, during sukkahs, what about eating in a sukkah? So eating in a sukkah is an obligation when you're eating to eat in a sukkah. What if you're not planning on eating? And you say, you know what? Let me eat in a sukkah. I have a sukkah here. So it's not an obligation for you to go eat something in the sukkah. You could just not eat. You don't have to eat every minute of the day. I know in America, a lot of people think they're supposed to eat every minute of the day. But, uh, but uh, that, you One know, other it, question I just want to ask you about. It, there's a lot of tzaddikim who are buried here out, outside of, you know, in, who are buried in Hutzlar. It's, and uh, they are not to be punished and why should they struggle to go through tunnels when the when the when during the time of the redemption and the when Mashiach comes well, that's an why interesting, they... right that's an interesting question that why did why did uh we're really going off topic you know because yeah. again the whole question in the first place is only applicable maybe when you study the story of Jacob and then you're taking it a step further what about living in Israel and then you're taking it a step further what about the tzaddikim that aren't buried in Israel so we're really going like this is really like uh, uh, taking us from, uh, you know, from Florida. We now we stopped off in South Africa. We went to Australia. Now we're in Zimbabwe. You know, you're really taking us. Uh, it's, it's really not. not, not I, I was just trying to not make exactly. I was trying to make the connection. I, mean, I don't mind, but I think the other people in the class might mind. So um, no, no. Uh, I was just trying to make uh, the connection so, so between Abraham and Avino and, and, the, and, and right. why he had to buy a burial. You know why he was Hashem wanted him to buy a burial ground in Israel because 
it seems like it's an obligation, you know, to do so. You know, that's why I was trying to make the connection and, and, and lead to this because it seems as no, though no, I understand. And it, listen, it's, everything in the Torah is connected, so it's not wrong. And uh, it's just that it's it, it, it's not exactly like the topic of this, uh, you know, this discussion. No, I am, yeah, but I am, uh, yeah. but it definitely is a good, valid question. I'm not. I, I don't mean to. Uh, uh, to say that it, it's wrong, I just feel funny because other people are here. But it's not, it's not a bad, no question is a bad question. Don't get me wrong. I, I appreciate your 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 ability to jump to different uh, ideas when most people, to, you know, it's hard for most people to to even the uh, you know. Unfocus. The obligation is not to be buried there. The obligation is to live there. To, okay, to, okay. Because he gave us the land to take care of it. Not to get buried there. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. So in Israel, they told you you don't have to wait for the Mashiach. If you want to come now, we will bring you under under Kanfeina Sharim, the wings of of uh, eagles. And they used to, to they had all the flights that they used to send out to the different countries to bring in the Jews that wanted to come to Israel. Right, right. So, th th yeah, there, there, there is discussion about all of these things, and, and it's they're all very important uh, matters to be discussed. Um, but let's let's just concentrate on what Rabbi Sachs is saying. So he, Rabbi okay. Sachs, is connecting this idea from the Holocaust survivors to to Avraham, and the fact that Avraham uh, understood that after going through trauma, uh, the 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 secret, uh, uh, the the trick is really to first build and then you mourn the past. And he says, two people in the Torah messed up on this. The first one was Noah. Um, Noah was the most righteous in his generation. What happened to him at the end of his life? He became drunk. He made wine and became drunk. And the Torah doesn't say why, but Rabbi Sachs offers a interpretation and that is that he had realized that he's alive and everyone else died. Everyone else drowned in, this, in the flood. So he must have felt guilty. He was overwhelmed by grief. And um, he's starting to think maybe he could have done something to try to save their lives. And he wasn't wrong. He probably could have. But by, so what did he do? He got drunk. And drinking is only a uh, means of, um, you know, dwelling too much on the past and then getting drunk, which is not helping anyone. Uh, then came the story of Lot. And Lot's wife, what did she do? When, when Lot was being saved from the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, so Lot's wife and his two daughters, two of his daughters were also saved. The problem is Lot decided to look back and um, she wanted to see the cities being destroyed with the, uh, uh, you know, the sulfur and fire. And uh, she turned into a pillar of salt. Now, that idea that she looked back, um, it is the background of these two stories that help us understand the death of Sarah and what Avraham did. He set the precedent. First, build the future, and only then can you mourn the past. If you reverse the order, you will be held captive by the past. You will be unable to move on. You will become like Lot's wife. So uh, this idea, he says, is also something connected to the famous psychotherapist Viktor Frankl that lived through Auschwitz, and he dedicated himself during those years to... Um, encouraging other prisoners, giving them the, the will to live. And uh, he tells the story in many of his books, The Man's Search for Meaning and other books that he wrote, that he, he would find in each of them a task 
that was calling to them something they had not yet done, but only they could do. In, in, in effect, what he did was he gave them the future. He gave them something to look forward to, to build. And this allowed them to survive the present and turn their minds away from the past. So they had to handle what they were going through. And he helped many people live during the Holocaust by doing this. And that's all about this idea, this, 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 this concept of dwelling on the future, not on the present, especially not in that situation, and not on the past, uh, which is what seems to be the trick. Uh, now, Frankel lived his teachings after the liberation of Auschwitz, he built a school of psychotherapy called logotherapy and based on human search for meaning. And it's like the opposite of Freud. Freud, Freudian psychoanalysis had encouraged people to think about their very early past. Frankel taught people to build a future and more precisely to hear the future calling to them. And like Avraham, Frankel lived a long life gaining worldwide recognition and dying at the age of 92. Now, Avram heard the future calling to him. Sarah died, Isaac was unmarried, and Avram didn't have grandchildren. He didn't have land, but he didn't cry. Instead, he heard a still small voice saying, the next stop depends on you. That's a, a statement from the book of Kings. Uh, he heard the still small voice saying um, now uh, and this is the, what, what he understood was that you must create a future and I will fill it with my spirit and uh, that's how Abraham handled the shock of the grief God forbid that we experience any of this but this is how one survives such a thing and um, it's all about building the future I should mention that uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe often was asked uh, with different tragedies that happened to, to, to people. And very often the Rebbe would say, your, through building will be your consolation. Your consolation will come through building. And what that meant was that any tragedy that ever happened, people would try to uh, the Rebbe would encourage them to use it as a springboard to build something in memory of this tragedy and because of this tragedy. And instead of it being an obstacle, uh, use it as a way of building something bigger and better. And uh, Rabbi Sachs ends off his, uh, his essay over here. He says, God enters our lives as a call from the future. And it's like us hearing him um, um, uh, that he's beckoning to us from afar, uh, urging us to take the journey and take a task. And, um, and this is what we were created for, even if we don't fully understand it. And he says that's what the word vocation means. It's a calling. It's a mission. We're not here by accident. Hashem put us here. And we each have a certain task. And each person has the ability to do something that other people can't, can't do. And uh, there's something that God wants from us. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Otherwise, he would take our lives away already. Because what is he? It would be a waste. There's no need for us to be here. Then they wouldn't, we wouldn't be here. But, if the, but there obviously is something that we are meant to, to do. And that's the idea of obviously Hashem has a mission in mind for us. And, uh, and that's what we need to uh, concentrate on is what this future is. And... Um, and so much of the anger, hatred, and resentment of this world are brought about by people obsessed by the past. Similar to Lot's wife, they're unable to move on. There's no good ending to this kind of story. Only tears and more tears and tragedy and more tragedy. The way of Abraham is different. First build and then you can mourn the past or understand the past differently. And that is the, uh, that is the essay. So 